Lord, you are my God, and I exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, planned long ago. Faithful and sure, you have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in distress, a hiding place from the storm, a shade from the heat. And on the mountain of the Lord, your word says that the Lord will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select food and flavor. And your word says, God will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away every tear. He will remove people's disgrace from the whole earth. And on that day, they will say, look, this is our God for whom we have waited. And he has saved us. This is a Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Lord, we want to lift your name on high. We want to exalt you. You are worthy of our praise. But we'll confess, Lord, that it's hard to do so when we feel low, when we feel beaten down. Some of us are perhaps tired from work and school. Some of us are emotionally tired. Some of us are sad today because remember our friend Aaron Kimenow, a student here at SPU who died in a car crash at this time a year ago. Some of us grieve other loved ones we've lost, or others who are experiencing illness or difficulty. We grieve that another 26 people have lost their lives to senseless gun violence. We wonder what it will take our nation to end this madness and our idolatry of guns. Your word says that you are a refuge for the poor, the needy, and a hiding place from the storm. And yet we know that there are so many homeless in our city. And as we welcome Tent City 3, and we decide upon a new mayor today, we wonder, will there ever be enough housing for people? So today we come, not because we feel great or that we have it all together. Some of us have been, it's been hard to just get out of bed. But each of us, Lord, brings all of us, the good and the bad, to you now. And we come and worship because we have nowhere else to turn. We, we have no other help besides you. So we cling to your promise that you will swallow up death forever. We cling to your promise that you will wipe away every tear. We cling to your promise that one day we'll say, look, this is our God for whom we've waited. And he saved us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So in anticipation for that day, we come and worship today. And I pray, Lord, that every single person here, wherever they are right now, might be found by you, might be touched by the Spirit of the living God. And it is his name, Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. It's good for us to be here together. We worship together as a community. So do this. Extend uh, some greetings, a word of welcome to those around you. Give them a handshake, a hug if appropriate. Let's greet one another in the Lord. Thank you, Priscilla and the Gather Worship Team for leading us to the throne. So, so grateful for you each week. I have the pleasure right now of introducing our speaker for today. And uh, if you were here for the Day of Common Learning, you, have, you would have heard from what Dr. Sung Chan Ra called 
uh, he, would, he spoke about the next evangelicalism. Dr. Royal spoke about how the demographics of, the global, of global Christianity has changed from being centered in Europe and North America to now being centered in Africa, South America, and Asia. And he spoke about how the decentering of Christianity away from whiteness was also happening right here in North America. And that is ethnic minority and, and, the, and the immigrant church was at the center of renewal and revival here in the U.S. And if the church was not only to thrive but just survive, that it must embrace this change that was happening. Today our speaker, Pastor Sandra Van Opstel, she embodies, she represents, and she's a leader of this change. She's written a book entitled The Next Worship that focuses on this kind of change for our worship practices. She is executive pastor at Grace and Peace Community Church in Humboldt Park on the west side of Chicago. Among her many accomplishments, she served as the director for worship at the Urbana Missions Conference and serves as a board member for the Christian Community Development Association, the organization founded by John Perkins. Last night, uh, many of us had the pleasure, uh, there was a Perkins community dinner and it was just rich in, 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 with her conversing with our students and just discussing life, justice, what it means to be a believer in our time and day. I'll give you some advance warning. Sandra doesn't mince words. She, she, she does that because she loves Jesus and she deeply loves people and she deeply cares for our church. So we're really fortunate to have her here with us. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Demos gracias al Señor, demos gracias, demos gracias al Señor. Demos gracias al Señor, demos gracias, demos gracias por su amor. Por la mañana las flores cantan las alegrías de Cristo Salvador. Y por la noche las aves cantan las alegrías de Cristo Salvador. Every Tuesday, as I sit in my office, I hear the words of our Spanish congregation and our food co-op singing, singing to the Lord, dozens of people singing to the Lord. And the last verse of that song says, Y, to, y a todas horas, los hombres y las mujeres cantan las alabanzas al Cristo Salvador. The last verse says that at all hours, humanity, men and women, sing praises to Savior our God. And the song says that flowers in the morning sing and birds sing and the moon sings at night. That everything about the world gives praise and glory to Christ our Lord. And so from my office, as I'm making spreadsheets of member lists and preparing for sermons and getting ready for the next trip and taking conference calls, I hear their loud voices singing at me and serenading their songs to me as I answer emails. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty. I'm actually not sure what key they're ever in. I can't figure it out. I sometimes try to jump in, but I don't know where they're at. And it's this live picture of Revelation 4, 8 through 11, that says, Day and night the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. And they never stop. They never stop saying, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It's this picture of the 24 elders who fall down before him, who sits on the throne and they worship him forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say to God, you are worthy, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. At the end of all things, in the image of God's creation, are the people of God on their faces before God, not standing with their arms stretched out, not hugging 
the Lord, but on their faces in awe of this God because they finally understand who he is before his presence, his glory, his majesty, his honor, and forever and ever and ever never stopping will be Catholic Mexicans and Pentecostal Puerto Ricans singing that song completely off key. Because their worship is not about musical excellence. Their worship is not about rhythmic accuracy. Their worship is not about conceptually planned artistic expression. Their worship is like the worship of a naked King David making a fool of himself in front of his people and his wife chasing him around with a rope. Honey, put some clothes on. I can't! The Lord is so good! Put some clothes on, honey. No, I can't, I can't put the clothes on because the Lord is good. There's nothing beautiful or fancy about that worship. There's only David losing his mind because he's caught just a tiny, itsy-bitsy glimpse of how good God is. And when I'm encountering their worship, it makes me ask myself, am I worshiping God that way? Am I seeking God that way on my face? And the answer is no, not at all. And I'm a professional. I went to school for that. I got a music degree. I have an MDiv. I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> and my worship doesn't come close to the worship of a congregation that sits outside of my office and gives God all that they have in their experience, in their poverty, in their pain, in their fear of being in our country at this point in time, they have no problem giving God all of their worship. Every Tuesday, from a place of pain, not a place of power, they're able to enter into profound worship. And it has changed me. When I moved back into my neighborhood, um, I thought I was prepared. I really thought I was ready. I was like, maybe about 12 years ago. I convinced my parents that everything they had done to get me out of that setting was gonna be okay. I belonged to a movement that developed world changers. So I was actually told that I could change the world. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's change the world. And I realized I couldn't even change one policy in our city or add one unit of affordable housing without a seven year struggle. And I was like, my university did not tell me that. My Christian movement would not tell me it would be hard. I was told I could change the world. I thought I was ready. I had worked on an MBA. I had gotten my MDiv. I had helped to plan multi-ethnic churches. I was not prepared emotionally or spiritually for the toll that that journey would take me on. The funerals, the counseling, the consoling, I was not prepared to be so affected by the opposition I experienced from other Christians when I called them to biblical love as I went around the country and spoke. Real love, true love that stands with people in their pain and in their suffering and in their struggle. A love for neighbor. And in January, I was left hopeless feeling like my 20 years of preaching, facilitating, worshiping, mentoring had not moved the dial at all for the church. But the grandmas in my community taught me to sing. And they taught me to pray. And they taught me to cry my way through. Even in the personal, when my husband and I had trouble conceiving, it was the grandmothers that held my hand. and prayed with us and kept us worshiping. When we miscarried, they lamented with us and cried for God when we could not. They were the persistent widow that asked for the miracle. And years later, when Justo Alejandro was born and we gave birth to him, I swear the community thought they gave birth to him. They had felt like they had conceived the child with us because they were there with us, worshiping and praying and singing. Our God is in control, unless unmovable, nothing's impossible. 
for our God reigns forever. Which lasts 20 minutes in my church. Whoa, whoa. And they sing their way through that thing as they pursue deliverance, as they pursue justice, as a community we throw ourselves on our faces in worship and prayer before God. And sometimes I want to say, could you guys put a robe on? We have guests today. <laughs> I have donors visiting. Could you guys put a robe on? But their worship invites me to understand that worship orients, worship disorients, and worship reorients us to God. Worship is about reorienting ourselves to the God of the work and not just the work of God. Because we are really good at doing God's work without him. We are really good at planning worship services and having events and doing programs in the name of Jesus without the Holy Spirit there. He's trying to get in, but we're just not listening. Worship is about reorienting ourselves to the God of the work, not just the work of God. And so I bring you to our passage for today, which is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, Luke 8. Luke 8, 42. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and she spent all that she had on doctors, but nobody could heal her. She came up behind him, and she touched the edge of his garment, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. But when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you, but Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone for me, and the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. In Luke 8, here's a woman who's been sick for a long time, suffering for years, bleeding for years. And when she has her opportunity to throw herself at Jesus, she takes it. She busts through the crowd. I'm not sure if this was part of her five-year strategic plan or if she had written about it during that day or she had scheduled it into her calendar. But she reached out to Jesus and grabbed him. And she doesn't mind that she inconvenienced people. Because this woman who was likely in pain for years, suffering for years, marginalized for years, knew that her healing was there. Her deliverance was there. Her freedom was there. The power was there. So she grabbed out for it. We don't know if she was ever married, but it's not likely. If she had kids, she would ever have kids or be married. The whole reason for her existing in culture, it's not 2017. The whole reason for her existing in culture was to create a family. So not only is she not, she's sick and she's in pain because you know if she was bleeding, she had cramps, folks, okay? She was sick, she was in pain. She was alone. Maybe sent out to another part of the community where people who are unclean go. Ostracized, marginalized, kept out with no function in society. Nothing to contribute, nothing to do, no intimacy. And the community probably knew who she was. And they likely thought that she had sinned or done something. Because you know the poor want to be poor. And the youth that end up in our gangs, they wanted that life. And people that end up in jail always dreamed when they played with blocks that they would become a criminal. People probably thought it was her fault. So people weren't trying to be with her. People weren't trying to be around her. People were not trying to advocate for her. Can you guys imagine what it's like to be in that position? Can you even wrap your head around what it feels like to be so marginalized, 
so unwanted, so unheard, so lost, and so alone. And you see Jesus. Nobody was able to help her. The doctors couldn't help her. All the money she had spent didn't matter. Her idols and other gods could not fix it. She had nothing to hold on to. She didn't have success or education or security or her own website. She had nothing. And when we don't have tangible resources, we can't grasp for anything but Jesus. She needed something that only Jesus could do. And even though she had spent all of her efforts trying to get healed, she had that one moment, that one opportunity to grasp onto Jesus. And so she took it. And just interestingly, when we feel competent, we think we can change the world without Jesus. That's what activism is. Our credentials, our brilliant ideas will make a difference. I'm just confessing. Our credentials, our brilliant ideas will make a difference. Our newly understood racial and socioeconomic privilege can be used for good. We now know we have it. Let's use it and steward it for good. We got it under control. And then we start. And we realize that we're battling demonic forces of evil, powers and principalities, that dismantling systems that have oppressed people don't break down easily or quickly. And that in no commercials, can't wait in the drive through community like us, we lose hope pretty quickly. Worship is not about singing songs. Worship is not about beautiful music. I'm a trained musician. Half the time when I lead worship, I don't know what key I'm in either. Because that's not what I'm trying to help my congregation understand. If I wanted to have a pretty choir, I would hire them. We would rehearse, record, and send it out in an MP3 for everybody. What we're doing on Sunday morning is rehearsing the truth about God that gets us from Monday through Saturday. When we're in a crowded classroom with 40 kids, no heating, it's 37 degrees outside, and we thought we were going to be a world changer as an urban school teacher when we're taking the train downtown to work at our consulting firm and we realize that everybody that works around us looks just like us, acts just like us, talks just like us, and the company thinks they really want to do this diversity thing and we're trying to make a difference in our world. We realize we don't know what we're doing. And we're angry. We're angry at the church. We're angry at Christians. We're angry at God. We feel hopeless, and many of us are walking away. But what keeps you there? The grandmas of your church <laughs> reminding you that God is in control. He's steadfast and immovable, and nothing is impossible for a God who reigns. Worship reorients us to the God of the work and not the work of God. Pastor John, our lead pastor of Grace and Peace, we have mostly people from the community that congregated at our church. We're not big at all. We're only about 100, 150 people, adults, and about 50 kids. Um, we're not a large church. But the Lord has seen for us to be able to like do these amazing, incredible things because people in the church have faith. They pray, and God just shows up in miraculous ways. It's amazing. I never have been around something like that before. People that operate, that have so few financial resources, that operate without a scarcity mentality. God is able to do whatever he wants. So people come to our church and they visit with the CCDA immersion cohorts and they visit with InterVarsity Chicago Urban Programs and they come to us from Wheaton and Moody and Trinity and they're like, man, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. And so they come and they join our church. Not a ton of them, maybe 20 relocators. Of them, you know. And within like the first or second year, Pastor John Sammy went down one day in the office and he was like, can you tell me why does everyone who comes to visit our church and ends up as a congregant here, why do they always end up in therapy after like two years? And he's not joking. They're having nervous breakdowns. Why is that? 
Our congregations are the ones that have spent 30 years in prison, have come out and have returned as active citizens. Our congregations are the ones that have experienced physical and sexual abuse and leading worship. Our congregants are the ones, I said, they have a spirituality of suffering. They understand how God works in that way. These folks have not been prepared. Pastor John says to me, why didn't you prepare them? You worked for university for 20 years. What were you doing? I said, I was telling them they could be world changers. I apologize I didn't prepare them. I didn't tell them it was going to be hard. I didn't tell them it was going to take time. I didn't tell them they were going to end up in their living room floor on their face with snot and tears all over their hair crying out to God, why the heck did you call me to this place? And inevitably that's true. Everybody that comes, if they're not prepared, if they're not paying attention in worship, if they're not submitting themselves to the spirituality of the neighborhood and the congregation, the spirituality they grew up in did not prepare them for that type of trauma, did not prepare them for that type of loss. When you sit with a congregant and a community member and you've read on the news that there was a three-year-old girl that was beaten and left in a bathtub with bruises all over her body and laying there and you find out it was actually a youth in your community, a youth that you've been discipling. And now you have to go and console her. That God is a God of love. When you're sitting across from a friend who your son has play dates with and you're trying to make a plan for when she goes to court next week, to see if the U.S. will grant her or re-grant her her asylum status. And the plan is, when you leave that court, if they put you on a bus, who takes your son? And as the mother of a son who's the same exact age, I'm trying to figure out what would I do if I had to leave my son behind because I'm returning to a war-torn country with nothing in my pockets. How would it feel to leave Husto in the arms of a stranger because it's the best thing I can do for him? And I look at our immigration policies that haven't changed since the 60s. And I look at our churches who don't seem to be hearing the cries of my community. And I look at my friends who don't even notice that we're in pain. And I ask God, where are you? And then I go to church on Sunday. And I step into the front row where they make us sit because we're pastors. And I watch the people of the church throw themselves on their face before God. And I say, God, thanks for putting me here. In a community that reminds me that worship reorients us to the God of the work and not the work of God. Worship orients and disorients us and reorients us to who God is and what he's doing and the fact that he is coming back to make all things new. So no matter what I experience this week, no matter what I have to decide next week, no matter how many kids I have to take into my home, no matter how many times I have to knock on the door in D.C., I will be there because our God reigns. Whatever you're going through personally in your family, as you think and dream about the future, as you seek God for your own deliverance and freedom, I want to ask you in that process, do you come to God or do you just go to social media first or your friends first? It's okay if we gripe. I'm totally for griping. We should do it. I do it all the time. But if we're going to gripe to someone, let's gripe to the Lord. If we're going to complain to someone, let's complain to the Lord. That's called Psalms of Lament. My Old Testament professor at Trinity, Dr. McGarry, said griping, called it griping for God, griping to God. We should gripe to the Lord because you know what? He can handle it. He knows what we're going through. 
and at the end of all of our griping, and at the end of all of our complaining, and at the end of all of our struggle and crying out to God, we say to God, you are in control. You're steadfast and immovable. And nothing is impossible, God, because you reign. The end of all the Psalms of Lament. As you process this insane and revolting chapter in the church in America, as you think about who will nail a piece of paper to the door and call the church to reform, get on your face. Cry out to God. Ask him to change this church. If I wanted to be comfortable, if I wanted to be happy, if I wanted to be successful, I would stay home with people who are struggling, struggling with drug addiction, who are poor, who are fighting for their lives, who are grieving over their children, I would stay there. The hard work for me is to come out here and to plead that the church be the church, that the people of God act like the people of God, that we would stop playing games with our spirituality and our religiosity and our church going and in our book reading and our conference attending. And that we would get serious about a God who is coming to renew all things. And at the end of all those things, when God makes all things right, we can say we're still there with them. I'm not leaving the church. No matter how angry or hopeless I feel, because the glory of God and the mystery of the gospel is revealed through the church. Worship reorients us to the God of the work and not just the work of God. Let's pray. God, we know that your word says that we don't struggle against flesh and blood, that we struggle against powers and principalities, that there are systems of evil, and things that we're fighting against that we can't see. We will make mistakes. We will hurt one another. We will be tired. We will be weak. But Holy Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Holy Spirit of the living God, invite us into your presence where you can orient us, where you can disorient us, and where you can reorient us to a living God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sitting with a lot of what Sandra has preached on myself. I'm so grateful for her and for her heart and her words today. Um, I want to honor that some of you have appointments. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up with the benediction now, those of you who need to leave. But I invite those of you who still want to receive and process and worship to stay and worship with us. So let me wrap up now with the benediction but know that you're invited to stay and continue on in worship. People of God, may the love of God the Father, the faithfulness of God's Son, our Savior Jesus Christ the Lord, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here, now, today, in Jesus' name, amen.